Okay, in Canada, half of our land base is forested, which accounts for 10% of the world's forests. On average, in Canada, 8,000 fires burn per year, and they affect 20 million hectares of forests. About half, on average, over the long term, are ignited by lightning, others by people. And if we think about the lightning ignited fires, they account for about 80% of wildfires across our nation. Now, when you see an image of wildfire like this, what do you think? What I see is a natural disturbance process in action, an evolutionary force driving change within the forest, creating snags and logs, unique habitats for endangered species. I see a process that is essential. What I'd like to tell you today is about how forest is a very dynamic and integral part of our ecosystems, how trying to stop all forests or fires in all forests have negative consequences, but that there are also solutions to these problems. And the solution comes from knowing that fire can do more good than harm. Wildfire then comes in different shapes and sizes. That's the first theme that I'd like to share with you. High severity, forest replacing crown fires are what we see most often in the media. These fires are emitting high degrees of energy and heat. They're moving from crown to crown or treetop to treetop, and they have high impacts on our forests. Although severe, species like lodgepole pine, a dominant tree species in the interior of BC, are highly adapted to thrive in these post-fire environments. In fact, the cones of the lodgepole pine are described as serotonous. They have a waxy coating that seals the seeds inside. And those seeds are released by fire and dispersed into the full sunlight created after the fire. They germinate on the warm soils heated by that sun, and they take advantage of the ash and the nutrients generated by the fire. Fire, in this case, initiates a new generation of forest. Even in severe fires, we get diversity in our landscape. So here the gray area has burned in a high severity fire, but you can see the green patches of forest that persisted. These are natural islands or refuges for biodiversity, the seed source for the next generation of forest, and places where birds and animals and insects can have refuge and diversity within their landscape. On the other end of our spectrum are low severity, stand maintaining surface fires. These fires burn along the ground and burn around the trunks of the trees, but do not necessarily kill them. They're burning the grasses and the herbs and the shrubs that accumulate from years to decades between fires. And when they burn, it's along that surface at lower intensity, and they stimulate the growth of seeds buried within the soils, the below ground roots of the grasses and the herbs. And we get our native plants stimulated by these, by these fires and rejuvenating the forest again. Our trees are adapted to these lower severity surface fires. Douglas fir shown here, as well as ponderosa pine and western larch have thick bark that insulate the growing tissues against the heat of fires. And we see embedded in the tree rings of individual trees over their lifespan, they can actually survive multiple surface fires. Those fires may cause damage to parts of their growing tissues, and yet they survive and they live on. And they record within their tree rings past fires of this magnitude. And so we have long fire records that we have developed here at UBC that show us that surface fires were common in the past, burning once every 10 to 50 years in many of our dry forests. And they've done so for hundreds, if not thousands, of years. Now, fire then is an essential part of our ecosystem but it also is a force against which we try to protect ourselves. And through fire suppression, we get, we get both benefits and some consequences. In fires like this one, a wildfire that started from lightning, but in the wildland-urban interface, it's important that we, got, that we try to suppress these fires because they put at risk the lives of the people who live in the community nearby, our homes, and our property. And so that's paramount among our wildfire protection and management objectives. The message from Smokey the Bear is an important one. Remember that a high proportion of fires are started annually by people, either accidentally or sometimes intentionally. And so 
Restricting the number of fires that are started by people is an important effort that we need to make. We also have highly trained wildland firefighters, British Columbians who have incredible skill that we export, in fact, across the country and around the world because of their talents and the techniques that we have developed. Now, the message from Smokey the Bear, the need to protect our lives and homes, has also been extrapolated, particularly during the, the 20th century, to protections of our livelihoods and of our forests that are such an important economic driver within the province of British Columbia. <coughs> And in fact, we became so good at detecting and then suppressing fires that in recent decades, we've successfully put out 92% of fires in British Columbia before they reached four hectares in size. And this is really because of the techniques, the technology, and the talent that comes with our wildland firefighters. However, there's also impacts on our forest ecosystems that are so adapted to fire. So if we look in the central and the northern part of the province, where those crown fires used to burn historically on repeated intervals and create those diversity of patterns in the landscape, where, where, where we have repeatedly suppressed those fires, we have made those forests more uniform, more homogeneous. And we've made them then uniformly mature and susceptible to other disturbance agents. For example, mountain pine beetle. Mountain pine beetle was partly affected in terms of its severity and its extent by modern fire suppression techniques. And so by trying to protect the forest, we actually compromise the health. And when we look at recent fires that have burned in those areas that have been so affected by mountain pine beetle, we see today fast moving fires pushed by wind and hot dry weather, but having effects that perhaps are pushing the boundaries of what the historic variation were in these landscapes. We have also altered the fire regimes where those surface fires used to burn. We have, through our fire suppression efforts, effectively eliminated surface fires from many of our dry forests in the interior of BC, the Caribou, the Okanagan, the Kootenays. And so these are places where we see landscape level change resulting from these types of good intentions to protect our forests. So our altered fire regimes mean less surface fire in the dry forest ecosystems. And so here you see a map, an aerial photograph showing the, or the grasslands in light gray and woodlands in darker gray near Kimberley, BC in the 1950s. In absence of surface fires, forests have encroached into those grasslands and woodlands. Trees have replaced grasses. The woodlands have become densely stocked forests with more trees and more fuels. There's consequences as well for endangered species. We've lost habitats that are essential for every one of the species depicted in this picture. In absence of surface fire, their habitat is degraded and critical components of their life cycles cannot be completed. I'd be remiss to not also add in the component of climate change. So in our forests in British Columbia, we've seen changes in recent years and decades. We've seen more rain on snow in the wintertime, lower snowpacks, earlier snow melts and earlier springs, giving us longer growing seasons, which seem like a positive thing, but it also means longer periods of drought. And with climate change, projections are for warmer temperatures, yet drier conditions, particularly in July and August when our fires burn. And so those climate change observations of what is happening today and the projections into the future tell us that in fact our forests in many places are compromised by the combined effects of exclusion and fuels buildup and climate change. And so more frequent and more severe fires may result. And so there's the paradox. By trying to protect our forests from all fires, we've actually made some of those fires more susceptible less resistant to surface fire, less resistant to crown fire, less resilient to climate change. So I also have a challenge for the students from forestry, for the professionals, from the alumni who are here and working in our forests today. There are solutions that we know of and can implement. And it's going to take innovative and proactive fire management. So let me give briefly some examples. And my colleagues will be speaking more about some of these techniques this afternoon. So wildfire, more good than harm. 
When it is safe to do so, when we have those ignitions that occur in remote areas or parts of forests that do not put people's lives and properties at risk, when it is safe to do so, we can let those fires burn. By letting wildfire back onto the landscape, we allow that ecological and evolutionary process to play out. We add diversity in the landscape. Ultimately, we create sustainable and healthy and resilient ecosystems. So when you hear about modified response, the management term that's applied to the decision to let some fires burn, and when we hear about the large numbers or areas that are burning, that can actually be a positive thing, more good than harm. There are some parts of the landscapes where we won't be able to let fires burn the way they would historically. In these parts of the landscapes, we might choose to actively manage. We might identify them as places where there are excessive fuels built up because of fire suppression, or where tree encroachment has resulted in a degradation of the ecosystem and it needs to be restored. In these systems, we can do thinning to reduce the density of the trees. And so you can see in these pictures logs on the ground where we thinned first. And then we are fighting fire with fire, using prescribed burn back into this forest, burning at low intensity, perhaps scarring the trees but leaving the canopy trees alive, burning the fuels on the ground, mitigating the hazard, restoring the ecosystem. We can choose to do these fires under weather conditions that have benefit to the forest and ensure that the smoke is vented up into the atmosphere instead of spreading into our adjacent communities and causing health problems. It's a win-win situation. There will be some communities as well where perhaps even prescribed fire is not our best option, but there are many communities in British Columbia that are nested in our forests and surrounded by forest ecosystems. And so here we need public education and then action from our communities and from our individual homeowners. We'll learn a little bit more tonight about the value of assessing fire risk around the communities, mitigating through thinning and altering fuels, finding ways to reduce the chance of fire spreading into our communities and creating, um, creating damage to our homes and neighborhoods. And even individual homeowners can make wise choices about landscaping and building materials that help us to protect our homes, but also ensure that we're a fire to burn up to and into our yards and properties, that we give our wildland firefighters a chance to protect our homes when we ask them to do so, and they put their lives on the line to pursue that goal. So I want to leave you with the message that wildfire is an essential part of our healthy and functional and resilient forests. Protection of our forests from all fires in all cases has unintended and negative consequences. We have solutions though, and they will come from innovative wildfire management, that modified response, from thinning and prescribed fires, and using these in concert with one another, we can mitigate fuel hazards, we can restore habitat and ecosystem function, and we can increase forest resilience to climate change. Thank you. <laughs>